My name is Amanda McCoy, and I am a pediatric orthopedic surgeon at the University of Pittsburgh Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. Before coming to Pittsburgh, I worked for about three years at Tenwick Hospital in Bomet, Kenya. I worked as the program director of the orthopedics residency for the Pan-African Association of Christian Surgeons and the College of Surgeons of Eastern, Central, and Southern Africa. Today, we'll be talking about the management of chronic osteomyelitis. I have no financial disclosures or conflicts of interest. First, we'll talk about the etiology of osteomyelitis. We'll talk a little bit about the epidemiology and then go to basic science classification and finally treatment options. At the end, we'll discuss some of the complications. This is one of my patients. He's a 14 year old male. He presented to me with uh, insidious thigh pain. And after we got an x-ray, um, we thought that this is either a Ewing sarcoma or a chronic osteomyelitis. Um, we did an incisional biopsy and confirmed that there was pus. And then he proceeded to go on with remine um, and a sequestrectomy. So as you know, osteomyelitis is a bacterial or fungal intraosseous infection of the bone. It has three main etiologies, hematogenous, which means there is a bacteremia in the blood and eventually it settles into the bone. We'll get more onto that mechanism of action in a little bit. Traumatic from open fractures and then iatrogenic from bone fixation surgery. So this is a 12 year old that presented to my clinic that had an open fracture, you can see it here. And unfortunately he went on to develop diffuse osteomyelitis. In terms of the temporal classification of osteomyelitis, acute means an onset less than two weeks, subacute less than three months, and chronic, which is our topic of interest today, greater than three months. In terms of the global epidemiology of osteomyelitis, a study in Nigeria revealed that 80% of osteomyelitis is hematogenous, hematogenous in origin, despite the high rates of trauma and requisite bone fixation practices. So this is something that's really important to keep in mind as we think about osteomyelitis, because a lot of it stems from hematogenous origin in childhood. In terms of the epidemiology of pediatric acute hematogenous osteomyelitis, it has an incidence of 43 to 200 cases per 100,000 in children in low and middle income countries. And then in a study in Uganda, chronic osteomyelitis accounted for 10% of outpatient consults, as well as 8% of pediatric admissions. Um, in terms of the basic science of osteomyelitis, typically the venous sinusoids around the metaphyseal region are very small. So when a child is bacteremic, the sinusoids can get filled with bacteria and then lodge into the metaphyseal region of the bone, this causing a localized infection. This localized infection can advance and spread, creating a colloid gout connecting into the subperiosteal space. This subperiosteal space can expand eventually sequestering the once healthy cortex, creating a sequestrum. And then finally, if this infection is not decompressed, it can break through the skin, forming a sinus tract. In terms of the microbiology of osteomyelitis, Staph aureus is the most common organism that is seen. However, in neonates, you want to consider strep A and strep B. In children less than two years old, you want to consider Kingilla, Kingilla kingai and strep pneumonia, as well as Neisseria meningitis and HIB. For older children, um, as Staph aureus is often the predominant, but then Staph aureus can be complicated by the PVL mutation, which allows it to be cytotoxic and often presents with thromboembolic events. And then greater than five years old, generally you're thinking about Staph aureus and sometimes group A beta hemolytic strep. Other organisms to consider are Mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is very common in my practice setting in Kenya, as well as Salmonella in children with hemoglobinosis such as sickle cell. It is very important to differentiate between mycobacterium versus um, pyogenic osteomyelitis. And sometimes you cannot do that until you go to the operating room. And at that point in time in my practice, I would take a sample for PCR gene expert to look for TB. In terms of clinical presentation, it's very important to assess the overall general appearance of the patient. Sometimes they are cachectic, sometimes they're malnourished and that will affect the course of the disease. You can look for localized swelling, skin changes, and evaluate for sinus tracts and exposed bone. So these are both patients that present to my clinic. Um, as you can see, there is a large area of exposed bone that's completely denuded, and you can also see the skin changes associated with the chronic swelling. And this is a child that also presents to my clinic, and you can see this is a very large Brody's abscess that started in the metaphysis, but then eventually crossed the physis. Fortunately, he did not present with a concomitant septic knee.
In terms of your imaging workup, um, oftentimes you need to get x-rays of the bone involved as well as the joint above and below. Um, you're looking for the involvement in, in terms of the joint imaging, you're looking for signs that it might be stiff or sclerotic. Um, when you're looking at times when you're looking for sequestrum that are within the cortex, over penetrated films can help identify this within sclerotic bone. And then if you have the capabilities or access to CT scan, this can be very helpful in determining the sites of the sequestrum as well as the maturity of the involucrum when you're planning your surgical management. In terms of your laboratory workup, ESR, CBC, and CRP are often normal in the absence of an acute exacerbation because uh, the infection is no longer pressurized. Once a sinus tract develops, patients actually decrease in their systemic symptoms. It is really important to evaluate the hemoglobin and hematocrit of these patients. Oftentimes, our patients are coming from malaria endemic areas, as well as they have chronic malnutrition. And so you want to make sure that their hemoglobins are optimized before you take them to surgery, as blood loss can be a problem. You can obtain blood cultures if a patient presents uh, with systematic sim symptoms. I would advise against sinus tract cultures as they're often uh, contaminated with mixed flora and do not really give you uh, too much data in structuring your pharmacologic approach. And because this is chronic osteomyelitis, you're, this is a surgical problem and you're often not relying on antibiotics. In terms of working up the status of the patient, I recommend getting albumins to, to determine what their nutritional status is, um, HIV tests to make sure they have well-managed HIV, as well as considering getting a, um, a, a finger stick glucose to determine if there's a possibility of diabetes, which would also uh, make the patient relatively immunocompromised. And as I said before, uh, when you send your cultures and your biopsy, we have to remember we have to biopsy what we culture and culture what we biopsy. I often recommend a sending a gene expert sample if it's available to you to look for a TB. And it's important when you send this sample that it's not contaminated with blood. This is another patient that presented to my clinic with a chronic osteomyelitis. Uh, he was actually a little bit more systemically ill. As you can see, he has pure, active uh, copious purulent, purulent drainage. So many of you are familiar with the Cerny Mater classification of adult chronic osteomyelitis. This is a two-part classification system where you classify the anatomic location of the infection with the bone, as well as classifying the host physiologic status. So stage one is a medullary osteomyelitis without, um, without breaking through the cortex. Um, stage two is a superficial osteomyelitis of mostly the periosteum. Stage three is kind of the localized osteomyelitis that we're used to seeing uh, with the development of an involucrum and a sequestrum. And then stage four is diffuse osteomyelitis. It's important to think, it's important to know that when you're looking at chronic osteomyelitis in adults versus children, uh, children tend to have a more robust formation of involucrum because they are still growing. In terms of the physiologic class, a class A host is normal and a class B host has some compromise, whether it be local or systemic. A local compromise would include having a vascular injury or a decreased perfusion to that area, whereas a systemic compromise would include something like diabetes or, HIV, or uh, uncontrolled HIV. And a class C host is a host that's very sick, such that they would likely be unable to tolerate the surgical management of this disease. I like the bait cure classification of pediatric chronic osteomyelitis. This is developed at the Malawi Cure Hospital. And this acknowledges that children have open physis as well as that they develop a more, more robust involucrum response. And so you can classify uh, the osteomyelitis broadly into three categories. Um, so category B is a sequestrum with an involucrum um, type. Uh, category C is a sclerotic type where you may or may not have a medullary canal. And then um, type A is a Brody's abscess. Um, where you can see a well circumscribed bone, uh, lytic area that is consistent with a Brody's abscess. So, what are the treatment strategies? The first treatment strategy should be to optimize the patients. Next, debride the infection and uh, devascularize tissues, then managing the dead space followed by reconstruction, stabilization, rehabilitation, and then consideration of pharmacologic treatment. And so we'll go th through these in order. And so this is a patient that was admitted to our, um, to our pediatrics ward um, with uh, chronic osteomyelitis. 
So in terms of optimizing the patient, uh, you want to consider their nutrition status. Um, as I said, this is incredibly important. Um, so while patients are in the hospital, they should receive high protein diets. You also wanna consider their immune status, as we said before, you're looking for HIV, diabetes, age, hemoglobinopathies, tuberculosis, tuberculosis, malaria. And so you wanna make sure that all the co comorbid um, diseases are being well managed. And then in terms of um, lifestyle, you want to add, advise for tobacco cessation as well as alcohol cessation. So this is a 10 year old girl who presents to my clinic and we initially treated her for acute osteomyelitis. We thought we did a thyroid department, but then she was away for a number of months and came back with this chronic osteomyelitis and developing microfractures leading to a recurvatum deformity. In terms of debridement, we like to use the surgical principles used to ag treat aggressive neoplasms. Um, so sometimes you will have to do it in block resections. Um, and it, as you plan for your incisions, uh, you do want to work around your draining sinuses. And sometimes I will make incision near a draining sinus and excise it in, in its entirety because that shows me the location of the sequestra. You wanna make sure that your incisions are over muscle beds and not over subcutaneous bone so that you have adequate coverage. And then you wanna make sure that your incisions provide for dependent drainage. So not on the front of the thigh, more towards the posterior aspect of the thigh. In terms of your hemostasis management, um, you can place the patients into Trindelenburg positioning. This allows for decreased blood flow, so you can decrease your uh, operative bleeding. Um, you do wanna consider the judicious use of tourniquets even in patients with hemoglobinopathies. You really want to be planning well so that you have surgical efficiency, and as well as you use packing, uh, packing uh, in a good way such that you can pack one area while you're working and then change the packing. I would say this is the most important part. Oftentimes these infected bones are neovascularized and the blood loss can be very substantial. And please don't forget that if you need to abort the procedure to obtain your blood control, that's what you need to do. Um, when, you're, when you're making your cord economies, you want to avoid circumferential periosteal stripping because it's the healthy periosteum that will allow the infection to heal. You do want to consider removing implants um, if they're retained, if possible. Sometimes if the fracture is not healed, you'll have to retain the implant. And so you may have to perform an IND and wait until there's a bone union before you go back and remove the implant. And as I said before, there are times where you'll have to perform an in-block resection of the bone and the surrounding devascularized tissues. In terms of your dead space management, I highly advise for um, negative pressure wound therapy. Uh, if you have the capability of wall section, um, usually we'll use some ABDs from the OR, we'll use um, a chest tube, and then we can use IA band and connect it to wall section. And this is very helpful to reduce the size of wounds as you're staging your management. You will have to consider soft tissue mobilization to cover defects. Um, you can consider rotational flaps as many of you are familiar with your soleus and your gastroc flaps. And then sometimes you're removing a very large sequestrum. There's a very large exposed um, medullary cavity, you can actually um, acutely bone graft in the Papinel method and allow for this to heal in. And then finally, I think antibiotic um, polymethyl monofalcary spacers and beads are very helpful, particularly when you're planning to stage the debridement and reconstruction. In terms of the reconstruction and stabilization, um, you can perform acute shortening for defects less than two centimeters. Um, once you do your in-block resection and you can fix these with internal or external fixation. Uh, the risk of internal fixation is that the, the implants may get colonized and you may have a difficult time clearing your infection. And the drawback with external fixation is that you can have pin site loosening. As we talked about before, you can do the Papinel method of cancellous bone grafting for large sequestrums that were removed. And you also can consider structural free autographs as well as structural um, allografts to reconstruct very large defects. And a good method to consider is a, uh, is a bone transport if you have access to the supplies. Um, you can use this with a circular fixator or a rail unilateral monorail fixator. And then for defects in the forearm or in the leg, lower leg, you can consider bypass procedures. And so this is a child that I took care of. He presented with diffuse osteomyelitis and a pathologic fracture. So what I did is I had to achieve bone stability. So this is an antibiotic covered ender snail that we placed in after we did a se sequestrum. We then removed the nail after your chief union and then waited until he formed a structural involucrum to perform a second sequestrectomy. In terms of rehabilitation, again, I will emphasize that nutrition is incredibly important. And you also wanna consider 
um, protect it weight bearing until there's a mature involucrum or bone union. So this little boy that I took care of here, he's five years old. And because he had chronic osteomyelitis, he sustained a pathologic fracture. So it's really hard when you have a broken and infected bone. And also because uh, long-standing osteomyelitis can cross into the joint, sometimes you're also dealing with the sequela of septic arthritis. And so oftentimes the joints above and below the, the bone of interest can be stiff. And so it's very helpful for patients to work with physical therapy. In terms of pharmacologic treatments, um, it's usually not indicated for long-term if there has been an adequate debridement. However, there are times you may wanna consider suppressive antibiotics if you're waiting for an involucrum to mature prior to performing a definitive sacrostectomy. This is a 13-year-old child that presented to my clinic, um, and he had a chronic osteomyelitis of his distal femur, developed this recurvatum deformity, and then he actually developed a fracture above. And so like the five-year-old, we actually um, fixed him with an antibiotic-covered ender snail, allowed for him to achieve bone union. I actually did a anterior closing wedge osteotomy, and we're removing this defect entirely to acutely shorten him. Once the bone healed, we removed the antibiotic nail and then performed another sacrostrectomy that was CT guided. So in terms of uh, treatment guidelines, I like the penny classification for pediatric chronic osteomyelitis as well. Uh, not only does it tell you how or describe the osteomyelitis, it also re recommends a treatment strategy. So for a typical osteomyelitis, you remove the sequestrum. If it's atrophic and there's no involucrum, then it's, it's advised to observe for three to six months. and then. Um, and then consider doing a resection and then sclerotic. Um, you can look for um, sequester throughout the, cor the cortex and you can do um, sequestrectomies. And then there's an augmented cerny mater classification of adult chronic osteomyelitis that I found is also helpful. That describes the classification as well as the treatment and initial surgical management. So for medullary, um, you can unroof a corticotomy and you can ream, and then you can place uh, uh, antibiotics, and you can perform a primary closure if possible, but it's important to protect the bone. Whereas for a diffuse, oftentimes it has to be staged and you have to consider doing an in-block resection with a stabilization and reconstruction in the, in the form of acute shortening bone transport and or bypass procedures. One thing to consider is that sometimes you may acutely shorten a remaining defect um, and a chain achieve a, um, a sterile union. And once that sterile union is obtained, then you can consider lengthening at a different time. In terms of complications, as you're well aware, um, you can have focal and segmental defects, angular deformities, leg length discrepancies, as well as physical, deform uh, physical disturbance that lead to leg length discrepancies and angular deformities. You also wanna consider a pathologic fracture uh, in a study in the US, 4.7% um, of children presenting a female femur osteomyelitis had associated pathologic fractures. That's very frequent. Um, as you know, the long existing presence of a sinus tract um, is at risk of malignant degeneration into squamous cell carcinoma. That needs to be on your awareness, as well as generalized sepsis. And finally, sometimes if an infection cannot be controlled and it's life-threatening, you might need to consider amputation. And this is a a four-year-old boy, he was transferred to my clinic from another hospital and he had undergone multiple prior irrigation debridements and he presented to me with this hip. Uh, we did a thorough uh, debridement as well as an end block resection of his entire proximal femur, unfortunately, and he still was developing infection. And so at one point in time during one of our debridements, we obtained the gene expert and it turned out this is actually um, tuberculosis. Um, it, as opposed to an untreated septic hip that um, progressed to this chronic osteomyelitis. And so it's always important to keep in mind that you could have a pyogenic osteomyelitis, but you also could have TB and sometimes you can have both. Um, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention. And I look forward to the discussion on the next day of the conference. Mm -hmm.